Hello and welcome again to episode 18 of Signals to Danger. I normally start by thanking you all for your downloads, reviews and shares and while I really very much still feel that gratitude, what I actually want to do this time is thank you for your patience. It's clear that this episode is about two weeks later than we all expected, um, but unfortunately this is something that I have to do in my spare time and due to other commitments, I've struggled to allocate that time over the last couple of weeks. Never fear though. Normal service has now been resumed, and I'm back into a normal release schedule. I will keep posting updates on social media, and if you want to be part of that conversation, um, find me on Twitter, Daniel Fox Rail, or Signals to Danger, or Facebook and Instagram as Signals to Danger. Don't forget as well, at signalstodanger.com you can find show notes, transcripts, and some extra bits of info. That is also the place that you'll find opportunities to support the podcast as well, if you want to, and that includes Patreon. I would love to take the opportunity to thank Ryan, Jay, Ollie, Andrew, Matt, Simon and Peter for coming on board and supporting the podcast in this way. Thank you so much for the, well, the vote of confidence, as well as the support. This week's episode might be a little different because I've decided to look at an incident that could so easily have turned into a disaster, but ended up being a terrifying near miss instead. A learning experience for the industry, and to be fair, near misses are just as serious as accidents as far as safety is concerned. With this in mind, well, I think it's time to start discussing this week's topic. This week's episode is a little different to others. Unusually, in this case, there's no wreckage to describe to you. No frantic, drastic rescue attempts to report back. This week's episode of the podcast is a lesson in the fact that despite everything that we can put in place, is that sometimes the only thing which prevents a disaster is a gap in time of just 44 seconds. The year is 2015, and the place, Wooten Bassett. Investigators at the scene search through the wreckage for the injured. At least 13 people are known to have died. Carriages are crushed, one on top of another. One lies metres away and appears partially burned. The railway industry is tonight coming to terms with yet another disaster. This is Signals to Danger, a podcast where we look at major rail disasters which have occurred in the UK, explain what happened, how the investigation was carried out, and how each of these accidents shaped the industry going forwards. I'm Dan, I work within the rail industry in my day-to-day life, but today I'll be the one taking you through this podcast. We start every episode by briefly revisiting the events which were taking place at the time, but... Admittedly, this isn't quite as far back as some of the others, because the year was 2015. The year kicked off with the most recent in a stream of European terrorist attacks, as gunmen stormed the offices of the satirical French newspaper Charlie Hebdo, and the siege of a hyper-caché kosher supermarket in Paris. Over the course of two days, 17 lives would be lost to the attacks. February brought with it news of UK schoolgirls headed to Syria to join ISIL and the imprisonment of pop star Gary Glitter for crimes I won't even go into here. On the 10th of March, one of the most famous fracas of recent places, or recent times, sorry, takes place, as Jeremy Clarkson manages to get himself dropped from one of the BBC's flagship programmes, Top Gear. And a week later, The nation sees an admission by Chief Superintendent David Duckenfield of the South Yorkshire Police that his failure to shut a tunnel to football terraces was the direct cause of the 96th death at Hillsborough in 1989. August saw the crash of a Hawker Hunter jet at Shoreham Airshow, a disaster made all the more terrible by the fact that camera phones and internet sharing meant that we all saw the images of the aftermath so soon following a disaster which claimed 11 lives. On the back end of the year, Paris sees a horrendous kind of bookmark. 
when a second series of coordinated terror attacks claimed the lives of 130 in the city on the 13th of November. The deadliest part of this attack was the mass shooting at the Bataclan Theatre. 2015 was a bit of a dark year at times, but unfortunately, that's the world that we lived in at the time. And you, as well as me, well, I imagine our memories collectively haven't faded too much yet. As much as that rundown might have left a bit of a sour taste in our mouths, not everything that was taking place in 2015 was doom and gloom. Admittedly, it was a dark time in modern history, but in the finest form of the great British public, we didn't let it prevent us from enjoying ourselves. The year came with many opportunities for people to unwind and escape from the bad news which seemed to litter the news websites and the television screens. Holidays and days out were just as accessible as ever, Well, maybe not when we consider the last year, but I'm sure you get my point. Seasides, museums, play areas and, well, let's face it, pubs continue to fill up with people over the course of the year. But this certainly isn't an exhaustive list of fun things to do. These are admittedly some of the better known, more broadly accepted options, but there are a plethora of more, well, niche ways to spend time. Many of these revolve around the great British love of the railway. Hobbyists build their scale models of countryside stations in attics and garages and train spotters or railway enthusiasts set up camp at junctions and bridges armed with notebooks and cameras. And in the middle of the summer there's not all too many anoraks out. One such example of the railway hobby is those who go out and about on rail tours. A rail tour is a chance for people to experience rail travel in a way that the general day-to-day service doesn't provide. For most of the people who get on the railway every day, it's a means to an end, a way of getting to where you need to be. A journey, and not the destination. But there are those who see this as the other way around. Those who enjoy the railway for the intricate beast that it is, and probably to be counted in that one if I'm, I'm being completely honest. Rail tours provide people with an alternative way of spending time on the rails. They're normally themed about one or more unusual factors. Things that set that charter aside from the everyday service. Quite often it's the traction, the locomotive hauling the train. A big fan favourite has always been the sights, sounds and smells of a journey on a proper steam train. Or the throwback to the time of the BRE deals. Quite often, some of the most sought-after rail tours are the ones that are dragged behind a special loco. If you get a seat on a carriage behind the only mainline certified Deltic, that is a hot ticket on this scene. The whole draw of the tour might be the enjoyment of Pullman dining, silver service, fine food and drink with the moving scenery of the English countryside whipping past the windows. Rail tours can also be themed around the route that they take. Maybe it's a run around on freight only lines that passengers don't normally get on, or routes that are soon to be closed. Whatever the draw, whatever the theme, it's clear that rail tours are big business. Every year, hundreds of them run from New Year's Eve all the way through to New Year's Eve. And they're a business which needs to be catered for. Locals, carriages and staff need to be sourced to provide the whole affair. And to be honest, due to the fact that rail tours are predominantly based on unusual journeys, you're unlikely to be able to bob down to your local branch of LNER or ScotRail to pick up a train and a driver. Because of this, there are a number of companies that have sprung up to own and maintain locals and stock, as well as running the services themselves or promoting them. Companies such as Vintage Trains, the Railway Touring Company, or Northern Bell. And this is the point that we fold back into today's story. One of the largest companies involved in the rail tour scene is known as West Coast Railways. In 1998, the company became the first private business to be granted a license as a train operating company. They operate a fleet of diesel locomotives from the BR era 
as well as running steam locomotives on tours. While they don't own the steam locos, they run them on the main line as part of the tours, and the diesels, however, they are part of the estate. It's important to understand that this is not a small business being run out of somebody's shed. This is a a big, one of the largest companies providing these very specific services. Large though it is, West Coast Railways, however, is nothing in size compared to a large mainline operating train operating company, or a TOC, such as First Great Western. That TOC has responsibility for passenger services across the southwest of England and ran hundreds of trains every day. It's the precursor to the current GWR franchise. The trains that these companies run are a little bit less exciting to the heritage crowd, however. Although, as uninteresting as it might sound in the context of what I'm talking about, GWR certainly, well, F, F, First Great Western, so FGW, certainly has a role to play in the story of the 7th of March 2015. Like many of the episodes we've discussed before, this is a tale of two trains. One a mainline timetabled passenger service, and the other a rail tour, a heritage service running on the mainline network. To start with, let's discuss one Lima 76, the normal train. Operated by First Great Western, this was an Intercity 125, or rather more specifically nine passenger carriages, sandwiched between two Class 43 power cars. At 15.28, this service had departed from Swansea, headed east towards the capital. Just before Swindon, it was going to join the Great Western Main Line. And we've covered this route before in a number of episodes, but to refresh your mind, the Great Western Main Line specifically runs between Bristol and London, and is one of the key routes across this part of the country. As it leaves Bristol, it weaves through the countryside, and approaching the halfway point is where you reach the town of Swindon. It's a big railway town itself, a key location on the line. It's just under an hour outside the capital, so it's commutable and the trains are frequent and fast. And it was in this part of the world that one Lima 76 found itself at around half past five in the evening, on the 3rd, with about 240 passengers riding along in its carriages. But it's clear from the intro to this episode especially the bit where we've discussed rail tours, that Lima 76 is not the only train we'll be discussing today. The other was one Zulu 67. Many rail tours carry a name, a point to be reminiscent about, and Zulu, se- Zulu 67 sorry, was no exception. This was the Cathedral's express charter between Bristol Temple Meads and South End East. The name was a callback to the named passenger service of the same name, which used to run in the western region of British Rail. In its original guise, it connected the cathedral cities of Hereford and Worcester to London Paddington, and ran between 1957 and 1965. It was the last named service with a headboard which BR introduced. This name has been used since for a fair few rail tours, and to be found at a fair few different locations. And on this specific occasion, it was a Bristol Temple Meads to South End train. One Zulu 67 consisted of 13 passenger carriages, but these were different from the carriages on the Swansea train. Mark 1 and Mark 2 coaches, built by BR between the 50s and the 70s. These are fairly standard fare for heritage rail tours and are in keeping with the traction at the head end. Being older stock, they are of a construction that fits the time. Mark 1s with underframes, with a body attached to the top of it, and Mark 2s with a semi-integral structure. Means they're a little bit more resilient. Despite their age, they weren't slouching. With 477 passengers on board, and 37 staff in the carriages serving them food, drink, and generally serving as support staff. A ride in this sort of stock is one of the big draws for people on a rail tour. But being honest, it's not the main reason people pay the money and take the day out their calendar. This is normally what's sat at the lead end of the train. 
Personally, I'm a big fan of Class 43s, which sat at the front and rear of the first Great Western service. They represent one of the true triumphs of British engineering and design, and they've been plying their trade up and down the UK for 40 odd years. In fact, we're only just now going through a phasing out of a great number of them as new stock is introduced on the various routes. But even then, these they're finding new lives in other areas of the country, up with ScotRail, etc. But the fact that they've been all over for four decades means that actually they're not that interesting, at least from a rail tour point of view, my personal views aside. What is actually a much rarer sight is what was heading up one Zulu 67. 34067, also known as Tangmir. Built in September of 1947, Tangmir is a Battle of Britain class steam locomotive. An 86 ton hunk of metal, the locomotive was withdrawn from passenger service in 1963 but was lucky enough to be preserved after a time. It's now one of a limited number of steam locos which have a mainline certification enabling them to run passenger trains away from the heritage lines and on the main line in between other scheduled services. This was the draw for the nearly 500 people in the train behind. The chance to go back to the 40s or 50s to be drawn along the railway at speed, the steam from Tangmere carrying back along the carriages, the smell of the grease and the oil and the smoke and the romance, the sound of pistons and rods and the steam pulsing from the chimney, that that is the reason that 477 people had bought tickets for this charter. The journey had started at 7.22 in the morning under a different head code, 1 Zulu 21. The train ran from South End as far as Southall, where at 9.36 in the morning, two locos on it were removed and they were replaced with Tangmere, which hauled the service on to Bristol Temple Meads, arriving at 10 past 1 in the afternoon. The train was then moved to a nearby siding and its loco and support coach split off and taken to a depot for a time, and it was later taken back off the depot and coupled up to the coaching stock in the nearby sidings, run back into the station just in time to pick the passengers up again. All of this means that shortly before 5.30pm on the 7th of March, we have two trains, one eastbound on the Great Western Main Line from Bristol and one eastbound on the Badminton Line which ran in from Swansea and Cardiff, and at Royal Wooten Bassett, there was a junction where these two lines met and continued on together as the Great Western Main Line. Both of these trains were rapidly approaching that point. The journey of one of our trains was fairly uneventful throughout. One Lima 76, the first Great Western service, ran east on the badminton lines. It approached the town of Royal Wooten Bassett at line speed, 70 miles an hour, booked to run from the up badminton, through the junction, and onto the up main, towards Swindon. With the priority that it, it had, this train approached the junction, under green signals, without any need for caution. And this planned movement, this timetabled route and path is exactly what took place. One Lima 76 left the up badminton at 70 miles an hour and ran through Wooten Bassett Junction onto the up main, unhindered, unchecked by signals and without incident. However, it wasn't quite as simple as that, or else we wouldn't be discussing it now. The point of interest is what happened 44 seconds after. Lima 76 passed over the switch at Wooten Bassett Junction. Tangmere, at the head of the charter service, ground to a halt over the junction, fouling, which means blocking, both the crossovers from the up and down badminton lines. It shouldn't have been here. The signals on the up main had been set to danger to protect the high speed train as it joined from the badminton lines, or at least they should have been. The driver on the footplate of Tangmere, Melvin Cox, made an emergency call to the signaller. He knew at this point that something had gone wrong. He was abundantly aware 
because as he had approached signal number SN45 at 53 miles an hour, this was the signal protecting Wooten Bassett Junction, he had seen that it was red. I imagine he felt a serious amount of fear at this and he applied the train's brakes fully. When he did this, it was probably about 220-230 metres from the signal. Tangmere and her 13 carriages slowed, but not enough, and they passed the signal, the red light looming, still travelling at some speed. And for another 550 metres, Tangmere slowly, painfully slowed, until it finally came to a stand, blocking the lines. A call was made immediately to the signaller, to inform him that a signal had been passed at danger, And I'm sure Cox was scared up until that point. A red signal could easily have indicated that the route was set for an opposing train and he may have been in a position of extreme danger. The signaller was aware that the high-speed train had already passed through the junction. In fact, he had already set the points for Tangmere to pass through. He just hadn't yet been able to clear the signals. Whenever a driver reports a signal passed at danger, there is a set process that must be followed. The main question that needed to be asked was, why had the signal been passed? The simplest version is the SPAD, signal passed at danger. And this is due to an unauthorised movement. It equates simply to a driver simply not obeying the signal. Either through distraction or some other reason, it will be very, very rarely intentionally disobeyed. But that is a, a SPAD, an unauthorised movement that takes the train through a signal. However, sometimes the SPAD is due to a more technical reason. A signal failure, perhaps, a signal put back to danger by a signal, or a power failure. In one of those circumstances, a SPAD is treated differently. The older method would be to call the the, the unauthorised movement SPAD the Category A SPAD. Nowadays, that's just called a SPAD. The other reasons are Category B, C or D, or now known as SPARs. Signal passed at red. In any case, the conversation that Cox had with the signaller led to this route of inquiry. As he spoke to him, he said, The signal preceding SN45, SN43, had been showing a green aspect to proceed and not a yellow for caution. This, he told the signaller, gave him no reason to check his speed and led to him passing SN45 by half a kilometre. Because of this, the signaller worked through a signalling irregularity form with him over the radio and marked SN43 as a defective signal. Cox was authorised to proceed onto Swindon, the next station on the route, and testing was arranged for signal number SN43. However, all was not as it seemed, and Network Rail quickly ascertained that this was no signalling irregularity. This had been a Category A SPAD. Sierra November 4-3 had shown a caution aspect. And Cox had missed it. He had passed a signal at danger with no authority, and left himself, 38 other members of staff, and 477 passengers at a very serious risk of collision with another train. As I said earlier, disaster had been averted by 44 seconds. That is the length of time it takes a high-speed train to travel a mile and a half. Due to the potential severity of this incident, the RAIB, the Rail Accident Investigation Branch, took the decision to launch a full investigation into this very dangerous occurrence. It was time to understand what went wrong. The RAIB investigates accidents. This much is clear. And as I've said what feels like a million times before, the reason they investigate accidents is to learn from them and to prevent them from happening again. 
Sometimes mistakes are made and we almost have accidents, but it doesn't actually take place, which is great. And I'm really not downplaying how good that is. But sometimes it's just down to plain blind luck. The fact that an accident didn't take place on this occasion does not mean that it couldn't have easily happened. Had that first Great Western service been delayed by 46 seconds earlier in its journey, or Tangmere departed a minute earlier, those two trains would have been on the very same section of track at the very same time. Now I, for one, don't want to know what a 90-ton hunk of metal full of boiling water, fire and high-pressure steam would have done to a modern passenger carriage, or either how the 50-ish year old carriages on the Cathedral's Express would have coped with the business end of a high-speed train. Timing was the only thing that prevented us from finding out. There is a whole area of health and safety which deals with this sort of thing, and it's called near misses. And it would be easy not to investigate them. Nobody got hurt, nothing got damaged, and to be honest with you, that probably happened an awful lot in the past. But accidents happened an awful lot more in the past, not just on the railway, but in every area of life, in industrial settings, in chemical settings, on rigs, on on buses, <laughs> in schools. But what about the next time the circumstances line up? No, you can't just leave it. So you investigate them as fully as you would an actual accident. And this is exactly what happened here. The REIB investigated this as a dangerous occurrence. The focus of their investigation was to be finding the answers to these key questions. Firstly, the immediate cause of the accident. What was the reason that 1067 passed the signal when it was displaying a danger aspect? Secondly, were there any safety features that could have prevented the spad from taking place? And if they were, why hadn't they worked? And also, were there any wider issues within West Coast Railways that might have contributed to the accident? The answer to that first question, the immediate cause, was quite simple. Well, they tend to be the immediate causes. We've talked about this before. That's how they're designed. The report lists it as Train 1 Zulu 67 approached Signal Sierra November 45 at too high a speed to stop before passing the signal at danger and coming to a stand across Rutan Bassett Junction. And that's pretty accurate. By the time Cox became aware of the danger signal, he was simply unable to stop his train in time. His speed was too high. It doesn't, however, really answer the stuff that we need to know. But as ever, that will become apparent in the causal factors. The first of which is that witness evidence and the GSMR call made to the signal after the spad indicated that Cox was not aware that Sierra November 43 had been displaying a caution aspect or more realistically that he had missed the signal. This meant that he had not reduced the speed of the train in anticipation of Signal Sierra November 4-5 being at danger and was consequently unable to stop the train in time to prevent an overrun across the abandoned line, which is where it could easily have conflicted with the movement of 1 Lima 76. When the report looked at Cox's recollection of Sierra November 4-3, he actually said that he couldn't recall having seen it and that was most likely because his attention was focused on other things going on inside the cab. There was a further concern raised about some issues with the visibility from the cab as well. Steam locos by design have this big old boiler at the front of them, with the cab right at the rear. And this means that forward visibility is through small forward-facing windows at either side of the cab, or by leaning out of the cab windows. Crews who work these trains are used to the difficulty inherited by this arrangement, but sometimes additional issues compound the problem. On this journey, visibility was reduced due to both condensation on the left-hand window caused by a steam leak, and wasn't helped by the fact that the exhaust of the loco was also being blown to the left-hand side of the boiler, and it was accumulating there. To mitigate from these problems, Cox had decided to drive for much of the journey with his head out of the window. Although he still failed to see or react to the cautionary aspect at SN43. As the investigation continued, the reasons for this actually became a lot clearer. 
And I know normally when I do this, the first episode, the first question is normally the longest answer in these episodes. But this time, the most interesting answer is going to be found in question two. On that second question, were there any safety features that could have prevented the spad from taking place? And the answer was, in very simple terms, yes. But I think it's incredibly clear that something went wrong. Mainline railway locomotives, multiple units and other vehicles are all fitted with a wide range of safety systems as standard. They are a requirement and they form part and parcel of the wider safety system. The two key ones are something, if you've listened to this podcast before, you know all about, and I keep talking about them. It's AWS and TPWS. AWS is the automatic warning system, and TPWS the train protection and warning system. And both form a really, really good safeguard, particularly at signals. If there are those of you who haven't listened to the podcast before or need a quick refresh, I will very briefly run through both. The automatic warning system is magnets in the gap between the rails, normally two. Permanent magnet, always on, and an electromagnet which can be turned on and off. These magnets form a structure called the AWS ramp, and you've probably seen these before, painted yellow or green with a slope at at least one end. When a train passes over the permanent magnet, a sensor on the train starts a countdown. If the signal attached to the ramp is clear, the electromagnet is turned on, and when the sensor detects it, it resets the AWS magnet and sounds a bell in the cab. If the signal is not clear, the electromagnet is off and the system is not reset. This means that a horn sounds in the cab, and if it isn't acknowledged in a set time frame, an automatic brake demand is generated and that will bring the train to a stand. TPWS is fairly similar. The system relies on equipment mounted in between the tracks as well, but the focus here is on the speed of the vehicles. The TPWS equipment is called grids, and you've probably seen this as well. Metal rectangular grids, it's... I'll say it's run seal, it's what it says on the tin. A pair of electronic loops is placed between 50 to 450 metres on the approach side of the signal. And when that signal's at danger, they're energised. The distance between the loops determines the minimum speed that the onboard equipment will apply the train's emergency brake. When the train's TPWS receiver passes over the first loop, a timer begins to count down. Now if the second loop is passed before that timer has reached zero, TPWS will activate. So the greater the line speed, the more widely spaced they will be. That's how they govern the the line speed that it requires. Essentially, what it means is that if a train is traveling too fast to stop in time for the signal, then the system will make it stop. There's also another pair of loops at the signal, and they're energised when the signal's at danger as well, but those are right next to each other. So regardless of what speed that train's doing, they'll initiate a brake application. So it should mean, in theory, that an AWS warning, incorrectly acknowledged but not acted upon, will be dealt with by TPWS. So yes, they're very, very safe and incredibly useful in preventing accidents on stock, which was introduced following its conception, but... As I said earlier, Tangmere was built in 1947. It's not exactly right off the production line. So it probably doesn't have these useful and life-saving systems, right? Well, not exactly. Tangmere did have them. Both of them. Between 2001 and 2004, Tangmere was rebuilt almost from scrap so that it could run on the main line. At this point, she was fitted with air braking and AWS and TPWS systems as part of the program of upgrades. A combined electronic AWS slash TPWS control unit and an electronic AWS audible warning indicator unit were installed, as well as an orange flashing light which would flash whenever the AWS warning sounded. So, even if Cox had missed the cautionary aspect at SN43, he should have been snapped back into concentration with a warning horn and a flashing yellow light above his head. So why wasn't he? 
The answer to this question would be the key to the whole mystery. As part of the installation of the combined AWS TPWS system, an isolating cock was installed. In all honesty, most safety systems on trains can be isolated, temporarily turned off, and this is for a really simple reason. Sometimes they break. And let's be fair, if your system which automatically applies the brakes on a train can't be turned off, probably quite challenging to take that train somewhere to fix it. So you would isolate the system in very controlled circumstances and take it to a depot to be sorted out. There are very, very strict and tightly controlled reasons that you are allowed to isolate these systems. And as such, they come with controls, a breaker, a lever, or a stopcock. And these are normally sealed, a seal which needs breaking to isolate it. And the intact seal formed part of the daily fitness to run check, which Tang Mia was subjected to. And all of this information is what makes the sequence of events which took place in the cab so surprising. On the day of the incident, there was an additional factor which added some marginal complications to the signalling. Nothing out of the ordinary, I must add. It's something any mainline driver should be able to handle, but an additional factor. Between SN43 and SN45, there was a temporary speed restriction of 85 miles an hour. This was not going to affect Cox particularly, as the Cathedral's charter was travelling quite a bit below that speed, but it did mean that there would be more AWS alerts to manage. As I've covered in previous episodes, most notably Nuneaton, for some time, a permanent AWS magnet has been used as part of the protection for a temporary speed restriction. So on the approach to a speed restriction, the train will go over a permanent magnet with no electromagnet, so the horn will always sound. This will jog the memory of a driver, make sure they're aware that they're approaching this temporary speed restriction and get them to reduce their speed. And if you go back and listen to the Nuneaton episode, you will understand why this is very important and can stop you having a train on your platform. As Tangmia approached SN43, it passed over the temporary magnet for the speed restriction. As expected, an AWS warning occurred and the orange light flashed, the sounder sounded, and the AWS indicator in the cab turned yellow. Drivers have around two seconds to acknowledge the warning before brakes are automatically applied. The untrained data recorder, also fitted as part of the refurbishment, recorded how long Cox took to hit that button. 4.1 seconds. He'd missed the cutoff. The electronic AWS TPWS control module had already generated a brake demand before the time that he cancelled it, and the train's brakes had applied. We've mentioned the rulebook before, the Bible of the railway. The book is a modular folder which includes all of the rules, methods of work, and standards which govern the safe management of the railways. These aren't the individual companies' methods of work. These are the ones that the regulatory bodies have set out. You can't not follow them. One very specific rule included within governs what happens if a driver receives an AWS brake demand. If it occurs, then the driver is required to bring his train to a stand and contact the signaller. Like pretty much everything contained within the rulebook, it is unambiguous, black and white, and not open to interpretation. Which is why what happened next was so unsurprising. Cox indicated to his fireman that they'd received an AWS brake demand. Instead of bringing his service to the stand as he was obliged to do, the fireman's perception of the situation was that he was being instructed to do what he did next. Move across the cab, lean down under the driver's seat, and turn the handle of the AWS isolation cock, isolating the system. That was also the conclusion that the investigators came to. Now, because the AWS system was isolated, the brake demand ceased to be effective after 12 seconds, only reducing the speed of the train by 8 miles an hour, It's clear it wasn't brought to a stand, and that the signaller wasn't cancelled. The cock remained open for the remainder of the incident. To add to everything else that was going on in the cab in this time before the AWS brake demand was cancelled, Cox received a further AWS warning. This 
was the one attached to SN43, and would only have sounded had the signal been showing a caution or danger aspect. And Cox responded to this one in half a second. He hit the acknowledge button and the alert cleared. But he didn't seem to do anything in response to that. Witness evidence suggested that he was unaware that he'd received two separate AWS warnings. He instead believed, very erroneously, that he had only received a single AWS warning and that this was associated with the speed restriction. And this meant that the warning related to signal SN43 didn't alert the driver either that he had passed the signal or that it was displaying a caution aspect. And this shouldn't have been the case. There had been two clear AWS indications. And they were already dealing with the brake demand from the first when the second occurred. In any case, that's what happened. A point worth noting. Had the brake demand been responded to correctly, and the Cathedral's Express brought to a stand, missing the adverse signal would have been a moot point, as SN45 would more likely than not have been cleared by the time movement was authorised again. And in all honesty, that wasn't going to happen quickly. The signal has to investigate why someone's been braked by the system and not by themselves. But it's not what happened. And Tangmir continued on past SN43, barreling towards SN45, two kilometres away, with a steady red light waiting for them. As it continued towards this signal, it encountered the first set of TPWS grids for SN45. Due to the high speed of the line, this signal was actually fitted with two. The first one, further away from the signal, was set to 65 mile an hour. So any train travelling at 66 mile an hour would have its train brakes applied. And Tangmir was travelling at 52. No, no application needed. But then 350 metres from the signal, there's a second set of grids, set to 45 mile an hour. When Tangmir approached these, the speed was 53. Too fast for a train preparing to stop at the signal. This is the situation that TPWS was designed to intervene in. This is a problem it can fix, a situation it can save. So when Tangmir passed over the grids, the combined AWS-TPWS control unit interacted correctly with the grids and sent a signal for a brake demand to the valve which would make it happen. This should have brought the charge train to an emergency stop. It was heading towards an incredibly dangerous situation and this was a safety system that was there to prevent it. But it is clear that that's not what happened because the AWS isolating cock was still open and the systems were tied together. This brake demand had no impact whatsoever. The train continued on for another 100 metres or so until Cox saw the red light at SN45 and put the brake in himself. Too little, too late. The RAIB interviewed both members of the footplate crew, and it was clear that they seemed to have a low perception of the risks of using the isolating cock to bypass the AWS brake demand. The evidence that they gave was that neither the driver nor the fireman fully understood that opening the AWS cock would effectively disable the TPWS system. And this lack of understanding probably helped to create this perception. In fact, the REIB spoke to a number of witnesses familiar with the operation of Tangmere, and they stated that the incident on the 7th of March was not the only occasion in which that cock was used to bypass an AWS brake demand. Some witnesses denied that it had become accepted practice by train crews on the locomotive to do this, with others estimating that the cock was used this way at a frequency which ranged from virtually every journey to two or three times over a period of several years. Clearly, the problem was bigger than this one incident, and it just so happened that this was the time that the factors aligned and led to danger. When we look at the way 
an operator instills safety rules and training within its team and how well the business as a whole responds to and adheres to these rules, we call it the business's safety culture. In fact, the report itself categorises the safety culture as the way safety is perceived, valued and prioritised in an organisation. It reflects the real commitment to safety at all levels in the organisation. As the investigations continued and the digging got deeper, it became clear that West Coast Railways had an increasingly questionable safety culture. In fact, the report called it weak. This brings us firmly into our third point of questioning. We've already discussed that the crews weren't aware of the risks of isolating the AWS cock, that they didn't know that it would have affected other safety systems, but they should have known that. Anybody operating such a serious and important piece of equipment should have had full knowledge to what it was going to do. But it's a bit of a moot point because train crews operating on the main line should have had it drilled into them that they follow the rule book. Overriding an AWS brake demand should have been a quick thought, swiftly quashed by common sense at the very worst. It should never have been come close to a conscious decision carried out by the train crew. But the fact that became apparent during the investigation was that this was not a practice isolated to this incident. Even during the depot manoeuvres at Bristol earlier in the day, the cock had been used to override the AWS. And even at this point, the lever was apparently without a seal, so maybe it was just this train crew doing it? It would appear not. It seems this was regularly done. There were issues with the AWS installed on Tangmere. The horn was not always as audible as it should be, and the footplate of a hard-working steam loco is a noisy place. Because of this, some of the alerts were missed, and it had become somewhat of an established practice to isolate the system, bypassing the demand to avoid the delays caused by having to come to a halt, and then having to build up momentum with a steam engine. I mean, let's be fair, they're not renowned for just push a lever and go. They don't move on demand. They take finesse and effort. The use of this bypass was so prominent that the absence of seals on the cock was never looked into when found by the inspectors. The rulebook required that the AWS isolating cock was sealed, and that the seal be checked before the locomotive entered passenger service. That was the fitness for traffic check that we talked about. And in general, rail uses seals for several things, and the seals are numbered. The number's recorded, and if any of them are found missing when that fitness for traffic inspection is done, then it's investigated fully. A legitimate use of those breakers, those levers, will be recorded somewhere. If you just carry out a fitness for duty check and that's gone, that's open and unsealed without any valid reason, it gets looked into because it means somewhere along the line somebody possibly did something dangerous. It's the whole point of the seals being numbered. But the investigation found that West Coast Railways didn't even record the number on the seals being fitted. They just stuck another one on every time it was missing. And believe you me, they stuck a few on. Even Cox, when he took control of his local, he was obliged to check for a seal. But he didn't, because in his words, it wasn't something he normally checked. In fact, in his experience, the isolating hook was never sealed. It's therefore unlikely that the absence of a seal would have struck him as being noteworthy. This blasé attitude towards the use of the AWS isolation is just a perfect example of an incredibly poor safety culture. Though from the drivers not using it, inspectors not logging them being missing, and management not investigating why. If it feels as though the absence of a seal or the importance of an isolated system is being drummed on a little bit too much in this investigation or even this episode, I feel the need to tell you why. On the 19th of September 1997, a Great Western high-speed train was driven from Swansea to London, just like the one in this story. The entire way back, the train had its AWS system isolated due to a fault. The driver brought the train all the way to the outskirts of the capital until the point he passed two caution signals. He didn't notice them as he was distracted putting stuff away in his bag. By the time he saw the red, it was too late. That HST collided with the freight train, causing seven deaths, multiple injuries, destruction of track infrastructure property trains, 
And you've probably heard the name of where this place was. It was South Hall. Now, I promise you now, South Hall is going to form the basis of an episode all on its own. It's too significant in our in our railway history not to. But it perfectly highlights the dangers of running without these systems in use. They're there to catch us when we fail. Humans aren't infallible. We know that. Accidents happen, mistakes happen. We do all we can to minimise that, but they still take place. If you voluntarily turn it off, then you, you might as well be kneecapping yourself. In any case, the, out- the outcomes of the South Hall Inquiry led to some changes in the rules around isolated AWS, and we will get into that a lot more when we cover that episode. But I feel that we now have a really good understanding of why voluntarily turning off such a crucial system left Cox, his fireman, and around 500 other people on their train alone. 750, when you count the other one. is a real, tangible risk of being the next South Hall. And Wooten Bassett, not being something we talk about in safety circles, but a mainstream, well-known rail crash. Moving aside from the actual incident, the report found some wider ranging issues within the safety culture of WCR. The RAIB's investigation found that staff working for them did not effectively implement the requirements of the rulebook, relevant railway group standards and the company's safety management system on a number of occasions. These included breaches in a number of areas, and I'll just run through a couple of them now to sort of show you how serious this was. So... Down from stuff as simple as two members of the support crew were present in the cab of Tangmere, although only one was permitted by the rules. Cox wasn't tested for drugs and alcohol immediately following the incident, something that should be happening in every talk. It's called four calls testing. We've talked about it before. The driver, he couldn't remember reading the weekly notice. We've talked about those before. There's weekly publications which warn train crew of speed restrictions, issues, things like that. The sign for them but Cox couldn't remember reading it. It had probably become an accepted practice for train crew to use the isolating cock and the AWS to bypass the brake demands, and we've seen that. The drivers of the trains didn't check that the seal was applied to the cock. This is a rule that's just been broken routinely. And even down to the on-train data recorder equipment on the locomotive, it wasn't being maintained in line with the requirements. There were little things on it that hadn't worked and hampered the investigation shortly. It's not a short list, and I haven't gone through all of them, but it is indicative of a company not meeting its obligations. They're running a train operating company. They're moving around hundreds of tons of metal at speed with soft, delicate people inside it. This safety culture wasn't good enough. It clearly influenced the incident, and it almost led to disaster. While the REIB ran their investigation over a prolonged period, as is the nature of these things, the outcomes of this incident were far faster for West Coast Railways. The SMAD at Wooten Bassett was listed as the most serious, most dangerous for the year. Later on, they worked out it was the most dangerous for a decade. Shortly after the incident, there was a meeting between Network Rail and West Coast Railways. A network rail walked away from that meeting, voicing the opinion that, at the meeting, WCR demonstrated that its controls, communication and commitment following the recent SPAD were inadequate, and that since then, the response by the senior management of WCR to the issues raised had been inadequate. Not minced words, but what followed next hit harder than they ever could. On the 2nd of April, Network Rail suspended West Coast Railway's track access, stating that Network Rail has had concerns about WCR's performance of its safety obligations for some time, and recent events lead Network Rail to believe that the operations of WCR are a threat 
to the safe operation of the railway. Those are words that you use when you mean it. They're not empty words. An organisation as professional as Network Rail genuinely believed that WCR was a threat to the operation of the railway, and this incident showed it. That notice gave seven steps which they could carry out to lift the restriction, five of which should be implemented within two weeks, all of which related to improvements in the safety management system of the operator. And after five weeks, the ban was lifted. WCR had demonstrated that they had made sweeping improvements to the safety culture, the methods of work were improved, and this sort of incident shouldn't happen again. Lessons learned at last. Also, it seemed in October of 2015, an incident occurred at Doncaster. In the course of the investigation, it was discovered that another steam locomotive operated by WCR, an LMS Black 5, had had its TPWS isolated by the staff on board. In November, the Office of Rail and Road, the ORR, carried out enforcement action which prohibited WCR from operating mainline steam services. And following that, In February of 2016, they issued a prohibition notice to WCR, preventing them from operating heritage services on the main line altogether. This was a revocation of their safety certificate, and the wording in there was also unequivocal. WCRC are no longer able to operate trains on the main line network until such time as they can satisfy us that its governance and operations meet industry practice and are fit for the scale of its operations. The only concession that the ORR made was to delay the implementation of the notice to give WCR time to move its stock to appropriate locations. And the impact on the heritage rail scene was not inconsiderate. When you take into account the scale of West Coast Railway's operations, however, that probably makes it scarier to consider when you take into account the contents of this episode. With regards to this specific incident, the ORR did not let the issues raised escape scrutiny, and they brought forward a prosecution for offences under the Health and Safety at Work Act. The company was charged with offences related to managerial controls, or a lack thereof, but perhaps more rarely, something we don't always hear about happening too often, Melvin Cox, a train driver with 40 years of experience who quite frankly should have known better, faced charges levelled against him directly. The outcome of both cases, well, West Coast Railway was fined £200,000 for their health and safety breaches and ordered to pay an additional £64,000 costs. Cox, he received a four-month prison sentence, suspended for 18 months. West Coast Railways was yet again granted permission to run services on the UK rail network and remains one of the largest companies providing such a niche service and it seems as though the directives to rectify the issues with their safety management system have been heeded. Over the last year, rail tours, like most sources of entertainment, have disappeared into the place we store our memories but hopefully we'll start to see them coming back in the same way that pubs are now able to open their beer gardens And soon we'll see the hospitality sector coming to life. The fact is that rail tours are now being advertised, tickets booked and plans made. Wooten Bassett is a terrifying example of how all the safety systems in the world can't overcome somebody who is intent on breaking rules. This is the reason our industry is so black and white. The reason our instructions are so unambiguous and methods of work so enshrined it's because if you keep cutting corners eventually you cut too far and you run the risk of disaster
Thank you for your patience and for tuning in to episode 18. Once again, thank you so much for your coming back again and again and again. Please like, share, review, come interact with us on social media. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook. Just search for Signals to Danger or Daniel Fox Rail. If you do want to support the podcast, and I do very much appreciate it, get yourself over to signalstodanger.com and either look at the support or shop pages. And until the next episode, travel safe.